Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of What the Field. I'm Emmeline and today I'm here with Maria Correa, Head of Comms and Community Engagement at B-Lab Europe, which is the uh, institution behind the B Corp certification. So Maria, please tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do and what B-Lab does. Perfect. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me uh, on this podcast. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. We're very um, happy to have you. <laughs> uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, I head up communications and community engagement for B Lab Europe. Uh, so, B Lab Europe is the nonprofit behind uh, the B Corp movement. Our vision is to transform the global economic system to create a more inclusive, equitable, and regenerative. Uh, society for all. So it's a very big mission. Yeah. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we're best known for our work with the B Corp certification, which is basically an assessment that looks at uh, a company's societal and environmental impact um, and promotes more accountability and transparency in, in the business world. Yes, I think it's quite a, a famous one, actually. And um, it's become... For me personally, like the, the little bee with the circle around it, it's become like the seal to look out for if I want to know is the company serious about their sustainability efforts or not. For those of us who don't know what B Corp, a B Corp certification means, maybe you can get a little bit into that, explain uh, what does it take for a company to get such a certification, to be able to use the little bee on their products. For sure. Um, so it's quite a, a rigorous assessment. Um, currently, there's three main requirements to become a B Corp. First, the company needs to do the, the B Impact Assessment, or we also call it uh, the BIA, uh, which basically requires a company to answer a series of different questions um, across five different impact areas. So it looks at a company's impact on the environment, um, how it treats its workers, Uh, the benefit it provides for customers, the impact it has in the communities in which it operates, and also the way the company itself is governed. Um, and then the company is also required to change its legal articles of incorporation. So most companies uh, traditionally are, are structured in a way that's profit-driven, um, so focused on kind of the benefit for their shareholders. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is shift towards a, a stakeholder um, governance model of business where, of course, profits are important, but um, ultimately a business should operate to benefit all people, communities and the planet. So B Corps are required to, to change the way that they're in, incorporated uh, to really embed their purpose in everything that they do. And then the last requirement is on transparency. So once a company is able to certify um, their, their impact results, where they stand, the areas in which they're doing well and where they need improvement, that's all publicly shared on their public profiles in the B Corp directory. So any individual can go and learn more about that company, where they're doing well, and businesses are required to recertify every three years. Um, so it's quite a process. And of course, after the company uh, completes the assessment, Our analysts um, verify that information, um, there's risk reviews, the company is required to um, submit a lot of evidence uh, to the questions that they've provided. And so if they meet uh, the minimum requirements of high standards of social and environmental impact, uh, which currently is a minimum score of 80, um, then that company is eligible to certify. Okay, so you work on a score basis from one to a hundred, sounds like, right? Yes. So, well, there's a possible 200 score. Um, and oh, wow. yeah, so <laughs> to, to certify, uh, companies reach 80, uh, need to reach a minimum verified score of 80. Um, and some of the highest B Corps have 160, 170. We don't be? yet have anyone with 200. With 200. Sorry, um, who would be the <laughs> highest scoring companies? Would I know them? Would we know them? <laughs> Uh, some of them. So um, Patagonia, of course, is one of the best known B Corps yeah. uh, and their score is around 150. I'd need to check. Um, but there are a few higher scoring um, B Corps as well. Um, but I think one thing we'd like to emphasize as well is, of course, the score creates a benchmark for companies to see how they're performing and to compare against others in their industry and others in their country. But Ultimately, like no company is perfect. So every company still has more that they can improve as well. So 
we do try to um, not focus so much on the score and focus on the collective impact that that company can provide too. Okay. Maria, you were mentioning um, that after three years, the certification is basically being re reevaluated to make sure that the company uh, is still worthy of it, to put it that way. Yeah. Uh, what happens in those three years? Like until that point, is there any control mechanism? You're mentioning companies have to publish their progress, I guess, or publish reports of how they're doing on the different, like the social front, the environmental front. Um, but is there any follow-up from your side? Or is there any basically a control mechanism in place that makes sure that they're just not publishing whatever data they can fabricate and it's not actually true? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so indeed, the certification happens every three years. Um, the company, in regards to their B Corp certification, they can only publish their latest verified uh, information. Um, but one thing that we like to reinforce as well is the certification itself is a framework for continuous improvement. So once the company has completed that assessment, um, they can see clearly which areas they're performing well in, which areas there's room for improvement, where they want to focus their energy over uh, those next three years. Um, but beyond kind of the certification, they're also now a part of a community. And I think the accountability comes just as much from the certification itself, as it does from the community that holds them accountable um, to continue to perform, to challenge each other, to collaborate, to solve certain in issues within their industry. And then when they recertify, they can publish their new scores um, and, and their new assessment transparently. But we do that every three years. Okay. Okay, great. And I was also wondering whether the requirements um, differ depending on the country, because I would imagine that each country has kind of a different framework, let's say, because policies are not the same. Um, I mean, throughout the European Union, there are more or less, but you also work uh, in other territories, right? And uh, even within the European Union, is, is there a difference being a German B Corp certified company and, uh, I don't know, a uh, Uh, Czech one or uh, English one or well English England is not part of the European Union anymore <laughs> but a uh, French one whatever you know what I mean like sure. it would just I think it's interesting to see since the label labor laws and all of these things are so different from country to country whether that influences the certification in a way of course and it's It's incredibly difficult to try to create a global certification yeah. um, and global standards across the board. But it's also a challenge because there's so many different labels and so many different standards, which is confusing for consumers and investors uh, and businesses. So our aim really is to create a, a universal standard that applies to companies across different industries, across different geographies. There is um, a certain amount of flexibility within the assessment, depending on a company's um, size um, and depending on their industry as well. So, for example, if a company is in the agriculture industry, they go through a slightly different track and have different questions that are a bit more relevant um, to their industry. Um, and then regarding kind of the, the geographical differences, in some instances, there are a few differences. So for example, um, when it comes to living wages and fair wages, there's different benchmarks in different parts of the world. So yeah. that's taken into account um, within the certification process. But we try to not create a lot of variables because otherwise you can't really compare um, businesses. So we, we look to kind of define um, yeah, what unites B Corps and, and what are the kind of standards that can be applied across the board and across industries as much as possible. Okay, okay, great. Um, so what would you say to critics um, that are, because there's a lot of, let's say, certification skeptics out there that say, because you do need to put some financial effort behind achieving any kind of certification, uh, especially things like organic certification, for example, is very expensive for a lot of farmers. So I know that, I mean, we're also trying to get B Corp. So we also know there's like payment involved, obviously, because I mean, you're not doing it for free either. Um, but then there's these critics saying, okay, these certifications, like how much are they really worth? If companies need to pay to get them, 
couldn't it be like kind of an underhand like i don't know how to say it diplomatically like an underhanded thing of okay i'm giving you enough money and you hand over the certification type of thing like yeah. what do you say to these types of criticisms For anybody who's gone through the process of B Corp certification, it's really rigorous. There's a lot of paperwork involved and yeah, there's a lot of time involved in that. <laughs> um, so um, it's it's definitely not something that can be bought. Um, yeah. And because of the time and rigor that it takes um, to verify all of those certifications, to um, go through that analysis process, that's what the cost is going to. So we need to be able to also resource ourselves to... Um, Yeah, be able to provide that certification, be able to constantly um, improve our own tools and our own standards. Um, so that's what the money is going to. But um, if you look at demand for certification, for, for B Corp certification alone, the demand has increased in over 38% over the last two years. So we actually have more companies in our pipeline than we do certified B Corps. Oh, wow. um, we've just achieved, six, we've just reached 6,000 B Corps all over the world. There's over a thousand in in the EU and two thousand if you include the UK. So across the entire European continent. So that's impressive. Yeah, it's exciting to see see that growth in the movement. Um, but I think you know if we were just driven by money, we would you know open the floodgates. Um, but yes. we do need to keep that credibility and diligence and be able to offer that service to truly verify all of the companies that that pursue certification. What are you like? your star companies, the ones that have like the highest score within B Corp? I mean, there's a lot of different, I think the beauty of the B Corp community is there's You don't a, want to play favorite, it's like asking, <laughs> asking sure. a mother, what's your favorite child? <laughs> it's, it's true, it's true, especially not officially recorded on a podcast. <laughs> okay, okay, let's just skip this. <laughs> But I would say, I would say the beauty of the B Corp community is there's so many different types of businesses. And every business has a different role to play. Um, so I think the the B Corps in the community that I admire most are the ones that have put competition aside, that truly embrace uh, the spirit of interdependence and collaboration with other companies within their industry um, who are looking to kind of come together to tackle problems in their supply chain or come together to um, yeah address issues like climate action or um, circular waste. Um, so I think... Those are the examples that I love the most, without naming any names. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. Yeah. Um, so staying a bit on the more on the path of the critics, let's say, mm -hmm. in this type of in this line of questioning, um, another very common reproach for certifications is that companies are using certifications basically for greenwashing. First of all, I would love to know how do you define greenwashing because there's it's like a very overly used term now, and uh, I would love to know it. Like for someone like B Corp, what does greenwashing even mean? What do you see as greenwashing? So greenwashing to me is that any organization that's making misleading claims. Um, whether that's verbally or through the visual imagery that they're using, um, but, but that sending a misleading message out in the world about their social or environmental performance. And that can manifest itself in a lot of, a, a lot of different ways. It might be explicit, um, or it might be just by making vague claims about the planet um, that can be confusing for a consumer um, or for an individual, I should say, um, about yeah what that company is actually doing. Yeah. So then moving on to like the second part of the question, which was whether you're, whether it's um, justified to be afraid of uh, certifications being used for greenwashing purposes. Yeah. So I think, first off, I think the, the track to, to becoming a B Corp has never been and will never be kind of a greenwashing exercise because of all of the work that goes behind it. Um, so all, everything that a company needs to submit um, in order to pursue that certification, the fact that that information is unverified, and the company is also subject to risk reviews um, beyond the questions that the company is, assess is answering in their own kind of certification process. We yeah. also have other, um, yeah, other systems in place to verify a company's negative impact. So a lot of people don't know so many of the 
other aspects of certification. So for example, every company completes a disclosure questionnaire. Um, where they have to answer um, questions about kind of their nev the, the negative um, impacts of their operations. And in some cases, um, by disclosing that information, a company is required to remediate those issues um, or disclose what they've already done to remediate those issues. In some cases, it might mean they're ineligible for certification. So there is quite a lot of rigor and thought into that process. All of that being said, no company is perfect and, and certification doesn't guarantee that. And, and I think there's sometimes that expectation that because the company is a B Corp, they can, they can do no harm. And I think what, what we really see is the certification is a mechanism for continuous improvement, for accountability and transparency. And so we hope that you know by, by engaging in the certification and by becoming a part of the community, that company is then committed to continuously improve their impact and again is hold accountable by our own assessment and by the community and by the general public. And the last bit is we also do have a public complaints process. Um, right. So anybody, any of the stakeholders of that organization can also submit a public complaint um, about that company that's then investigated. So there's a lot of different systems in place um, to address any greenwashing claims. Or are you experiencing a lot of like failed uh, applications? I think on average, 40% of the companies that pursue certification actually go on to certify. Um, oh, wow. So there are a lot of like dropouts or <laughs> not sure I should name them. <laughs> well, I think it's hard to meet, you know, we, we really do try to set high standards um, for, for certification without making it inaccessible. Um, so... I think a lot of companies initially pursue certification and then have to go back and introduce new policies or continue to work on their impact until the point that they're ready to um, submit their application. But our aim is, is to help all companies go on that journey. And our tools are actually available for anybody to use whether or not they're pursuing certification. So any company can take the B impact assessment And, and work to improve their impact. Would you say that it's easier for companies that have a lot of money basically behind them to achieve B Corp status? Is it like that point of entry? Is it high for for smaller companies? I mean, our, the B Corp community, I think, uh, initially started um, really led by the pioneering purpose-driven um, small medium enterprises mm -hmm. that were really leading the way. And those companies are still, uh, still make up the majority of our community, um, okay. between 70 to, to 85% in different parts of the world. Um, I think the challenge we hear from some of the smaller companies are, are the resources it takes to put in place some of these practices and, and the resources it takes to truly measure your environmental impact um, and, and, Yeah, put those those procedures in place as well. So some of the smaller companies um, have a bit more challenges with that, especially if their teams are, you know, less than 10 people. But we do see quite a few companies do that. I think on the flip side, while some of the larger companies have um, more resources to, to measure and track their impact, um, they also have a lot more subsidiaries, for example, or a lot more offices. So yeah. they need to complete different assessments for all of their different offices. So it's a lot harder of a process. And, and there also are some additional requirements for, for large enterprises and multinationals. So I wouldn't say it's easier for them, even though they do have um, some of the financial and um, team resources to help them on that journey. Yeah. Speaking of like corporates and big companies, Are there companies that you say you wouldn't work with? Or can you imagine that even like more controversial companies such as maybe, I don't know, Amazon that were not exactly famous for great working conditions, let's say, um, drivers. <laughs> um, would you ever think to include someone like a company like Amazon or I don't even know, Coca-Cola or other like big uh, brands or big names that are, have kind of bad fame almost in the sustainability world or yeah. like social justice world? I think there's a natural tension out in the world to um, want to exclude um, certain businesses um, from things like certifications, but yeah. also wanting to uh, 
tackle something massive like creating systems change and really transforming uh, the, the, the role of business in the world and really trying to address these massive global issues that we're facing today with the climate crisis, with inequalities. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a really big tension on, on how do you go about doing that. And in order to achieve that, you do need to get everybody on board. Um, we're not going to solve these problems if we're just talking to a few niche companies um, in the world. That being said, um, I think some of these multinationals are, are a long, long way away from, from certifying. But I think one question I'd ask back uh, to, to you and to your audiences as well is, if we're truly serious about transforming, um, about you know using business as a force for good, and this idea that businesses can, you know, they're a huge part of the problem, but they can also be a part of the solution. If we truly believe that, um, then we're, we want to transform the economic system. So we we need to get a lot of these companies, especially the ones that are most responsible for the problems, to transform the way that they operate um, and come on board on this impact improvement journey. Currently, we do have um, some stances for certain industries. Um, so we have a couple controversial industries um, where either they're ineligible for certification, like fossil fuel companies, yeah. um, or um, they have to complete you know, different requirements in order to certify. So I wouldn't say that any company um, is completely ineligible for life. Um, I think they have a long way to go, but I think we would hope that Eventually, many, many years from now, if a company like that is able to not just operate uh, in, in a profit driven uh, machine, but to be able to really take into account the interests of all of their stakeholders, of the environment, of the customers, of the community into account in their decision making, that would solve a lot of the issues that we're facing today. So I think we also need to embrace and encourage people to go on that journey, whether that means ever being eligible for certification or, you know, just empowering them um, to go on that impact management journey. And not be scared of greenwashing claims, because I also feel like it's a legitimate fear of some companies that if they're just going to do something that might be a little change and not perceived as a big enough change. And then they, yeah. they even dare to talk about it, then they will just receive some sort of public backlash. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I think we live in quite a polarized society and, and we need to embrace a bit more empathy and nuance yeah. in everything that we do. Um, and I think there's a lot of companies that handle this with a lot of grace um, and a lot of expertise and humility. Uh, one of our B Corps, Tony's Chocolonely, Only, is an incredible example of this. They're committed to ending slavery and child labor in the cocoa supply chain. Yeah. Um, but they've come out at times and been transparent about when they've identified uh, slavery in their supply chains. And instead of walking away from that supplier, they've worked with different suppliers to implement new practices um, and, and really change the way that that supplier operates, not just to benefit Tony's, but for all of the other um, companies that they supply to. So we're only going to, to solve these problems if we really get every company to transform. So yeah, hopefully... I think that's there. that's a beautiful uh, way to end this podcast. But I did have one last question, which is, what is your biggest lesson, or what was your biggest lesson uh, working at a at an organization such as B Lab and working with the B Corp certification, maybe? I think what B Lab and the B Corp community have really taught me is about the importance of the spirit of interdependence. We're not going to solve any problem alone. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, the certification helps companies transform their own operations, but it's only when companies then come together to transform the industries that they operate in, um, the policies and the countries in which they operate, that we're actually going to solve these problems. And also the interdependence between the problems that we're trying to solve. So if you just look at emissions or if you just look at a company's environmental impact, That doesn't tell the, the whole story because there's also huge impacts to um, society and inclusivity and, uh, yeah, inequality um, that are very closely related to the planet. So I think also with that spirit of interdependence also comes the interdependence of people and the planet. And I think B-Lab and the B Corp community has really taught me about the importance of that and the importance of collaboration in, in trying to tackle these momentous problems that we're trying to solve. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. 
so it's interconnectedness and no one has to do it on their own type of mentality, right? No one can do it on their own. Indeed, and I think um, crowd farming uh, is a great example of this, of all of the different partners and um, yet yeah, other people that you bring into the ecosystem to, to help uh, really change, change the food industry as well. So I think that beauty of collaboration um, within industries is ultimately what gives me hope. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful note to end this podcast on. Thank you so much, Maria, for sitting down with me and um, making me a little wiser about uh, B Corp and all that it entails. And thank you also to our audience for being with us for another episode. I hope you enjoyed this little field trip to the world of B Corp and greenwashing. And yeah, until next time. Bye. Thank you so much.